Let's uh, take a look at Acts chapter 6 and see what we're going to get through today. Obviously, I didn't officially prepare anything, but Acts chapter 6 is not an overly long chapter. I don't even know if it's supposed to be the chapter that we're supposed to look at today, but we'll talk about it. The apostles have been through their second round of conflict and now some pretty intense persecution with the Jewish authorities. They have been whipped, <coughs> flogged a little bit, most likely, and all 12 of them, and told they're not allowed to go about preaching in the name of Jesus anymore. But whether they're in the temple or going from house to house, they never stop proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So despite the external opposition, things are still moving forward and things are pretty good. Now, before we turn to the third and rather climactic episode of the Jerusalem church and th their persecution with the Jewish authorities that will culminate in Stephen's death and the, uh, the persecution in Jerusalem that will actually scatter the church and make them do their job beyond Jerusalem. Because thus far, the one thing they haven't done is move beyond Jerusalem. Before we do that, we get some internal conflict and resolution in the church. So this is six, oh, the first seven verses. Somebody want to read, read verses one through four. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic, Hebraic? Hebraic, yeah. Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Okay, so just walking through the basic conflict here. This is around the same time as the events that we discussed last week, very early in the church, but it, it's only one group, Jews. Th those Jews have fit together in two principal categories, the Hebraic and the Hellenized Jews. What is the difference between these? Does anybody know what a Hebraic or a Hellenized Jew was? My little note says that Hellenized were the ones that had adopted Greek culture. And were speaking. Good. Okay. Uh, that's, yeah. Jews. So, so, the, yeah. Typically, the Hellenized Jews were, were more traveled outside the Holy Land. They spent the bulk of their time outside of it in general. And because of that, they were further away from the temple regularly. They were further away from the Pharisees and the Sadducees regularly. The, this has been, been going on since Alexander conquered and brought Greek culture in 323 BC. Okay? So this is a 300-year-old group. They were the group that, you know, living outside of the Holy Land for pretty much their, their whole lives and only going to Jerusalem for special occasions and festivals and stuff, holidays. They were the ones who said, well, do we, without the temple being down the road or, you know, within a week's journey or something, how do we express our Judaism? They were more influenced by Greek culture, obviously, because they lived all throughout the empire. So, so by this point, the, the Jews, the, the northern ten tribes were scattered by Assyria in 722 BC. So they've been living outside of the Holy Land for generations at this point. Alexander the Great comes along and starts giving people Greek education. So they had to start learning Greek. Uh, th th this, by the way, if I can mention this, because I was thinking about this a lot the last couple of weeks. You know, we hear a lot today about white culture and white guilt and all this stuff and, and that, uh, you know, we need to, as white people, be listening to the voices of, of other cultures and stuff. As if before Alexander, there was never any forcing of your culture down on other people. When in fact, what I mean is historically, until Alexander, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, they were all from the East. They were not the white Indo-European 
uh, group and stuff. Until European, all of Israel's enemies tend to come from the east, especially once the divided uh, the, the the kingdom solidifies under David and uh, imperial power under Assyria starts developing on a worldwide scale of the world of that day. So uh, historically, it's it's like when you hear messages like that that uh, white people need to give up certain stuff for, for colored people of, of all color and stuff. They pick and choose what history they actually follow. And uh, they pick and choose all the history that will support them, but they ignore all the history that doesn't actually support their, their arguments. I think you're assuming that people are using white guilt in anything other than an American context, and it, they are not. It, White guilt is an American concept, and, and they, they stemming from the idea that we need to to basically make cultural reparations for slavery. Right. They're not looking back to whether there was more colored people versus more Indo-European people in prehistoric times. The, right. So, so it, you're right that that is an American thing, but the, more and more it's becoming an international issue. Uh, I, I'm hearing of it in context of uh, all all manner of things that Europe had to do, and Europe needs to make reparations for 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 people that the British Empire did over to to that. I mean, uh, so whatever context you you argue for uh, in that, you know, if you're arguing for for reparations or something. You're arguing for it in a cultural time period and stuff. Uh, but before Alexander, there's still things that would require reparations if you actually followed those reparation arguments to their logical conclusions. And it wouldn't just be white people making reparations for whatever various historical groups they they conquered or something. No, xenophobia has existed since the dawn of time. Right. And it, it's not consolidated with white people. Right. And, and but but the oversimplification Asian people, Asian people, the, the oversimplification African of arguments today. The oversimplification of arguments today is that it's it's a white thing on uh, other races. And if you just follow the historical timelines and stuff, it's it's always been around. You didn't enslave people based on their race uh, until, you know, our form of slavery took place and stuff, and uh, you you enslaved anybody that you could conquer in battle. And you you, you see the Assyrians, the Babylonians, uh, the Persian, the Medo-Persian stuff, they do all that. And then it's like some people start tracking history when Alexander started doing it because he was a Greek, uh, which probably means he was a paler in complexion than the people of the East. And, and so when you're, you're dealing with these historical and often ancient issues, you pick and choose oftentimes whichever historical records are going to benefit your underlying argument. And it, it is fallacious. Here, what, what's going on is, is a history, a conflict in their present day, but a history that's been around since at least Alexander. So for 300 years, Jews have been trying to figure out, well, are we Jewish because we keep the law like the people living in the Holy Land? And for Hellenized Jews, the answer is no. You're outside of the Holy Land. You're very far away from the temple. And oftentimes, if you see the temple at all, it may only be once or twice in your entire lifetime. So how do you express your Judaism and your Jewish ethnicity, we, we would probably say, while still living in Greek culture. And there was big arguments, big conflicts, and big discussions about it. But ultimately, the Hebraic Jews was a very diverse expression. People in Rome didn't express Judaism the same way as the people uh, in Asia Minor. And the people in Africa would do it differently than the people in Asia Minor and stuff. So it's a bunch of diversity. But ultimately, they, they found a way to agree on the fact that they were all Jewish. But the Hebraic Jews were generally the most strict overall by this point in time because of the influence of the Pharisees for generations. 
So when the conflict comes up, it's, it's like there's an underlying tension that's always been there. And the Hebraic Jews, whether they're actually overlooking the daily distribution of food for the Hellenized Jews, or whether it's just a perceived slight, we don't know. We get it in the voice of the Hellenized Jews that their widows are being overlooked. That's, that's at least the historical complaint. So the 12 come up with this idea. And, but, but first they say, look, this isn't our business. This is not what we're supposed to spend our time on. We have bigger fish to fry than waiting tables. Now, does that seem kind of douchey? <laughs> that is the uh, academic term. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I think that if they had dropped it right there, if they were just like, yes. I don't care, mm. and moved on. But they didn't. Like, they mm -hmm. followed with, like, I see it's an issue, mm -hmm. and I think we should appoint people to fix it. But that's not where we're spending our time. You need to delegate somebody else. Okay. Th th that's a good word. Delegation. So they're going to delegate. Uh, Choose seven men from among you. And, and who's choosing here? Just the twelve, right? Um, mm, well, the twelve says seven to choose. So the Jews all are deciding. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would probably say from both groups, the Hebraic and the Hellenized Jews, both groups of these Jews are tasked with choosing. So uh one thing that I, I only like recently within the last year seemed to have clicked into my mind was that. Going back over to this uh, timeline that I introduced a, a few weeks ago, you'll see churches broken up by how they govern. Congregational, which is what Baptists are. The Presbyterian, which is like the Assembly of the Elders and do the bulk of the governing. And the Episcopal, which is like the bishops and, and cardinals and stuff up top, right? So three forms of governing. But the thing that you'll see in the New Testament is that actually all three of them exist in churches. Uh, there is not one and only one way to govern. Here, the apostles, who would, you would probably put under a presbytery form of, of government, say, you know what? Th this is not something that we need to spend a bulk of time solving, but it is a solvable problem. And they delegate it out to the community to solve by actually picking uh, people to perform the function. So well, and not just people. People who are full of spirit and wisdom. Good. I mean, that yeah. they still assigned true value to the feeding of their flock. It's not that they're like, hey, who's not doing anything right now? Pass out rice. <laughs> like, there is value to this role, and it shows a, a prioritization of social services within a burgeoning church. It, yeah, Priority they're, they're, of social services. Because they're they're worried about feeding widows here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like this is not they're not worried about, you know they're basically what they're saying is like we need to be evangelizing, right? But people gotta eat. Yeah. And that's yeah. what social services is. In well, in its most basic form. Yeah. And it almost connects back to like the the parts of the body that we're all the parts of the body mm -hmm. and, and the disciples are acknowledging like we're the eyeball. But, but we need some hands. hands. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay for us not to be the eyeball. We're right. not going to be a good leader if we're busy trying to be the right. hand. Who are our hands? Right. Yeah, I, I would imagine at, at some point, if Luke knows this, Paul probably knows this story as well. Mm -hmm. And that by the time Luke's writing in Corinthians about the different body parts and stuff, he's probably reflected back on some of these historical stories and stuff as to develop his, his theology there. And you're absolutely right. It's like, look, this isn't, it would be wrong of us to neglect the responsibility that we know God gave us. We know God set us to this task. This new task is arising. We can't neglect this task to fulfill it, but it is an important thing that needs to get done. So we need to turn over this responsibility is, is what my NIV says. And I like that phrase. You pick the men, We'll in, invest them with the authority to do this much. Okay? So that's the plan. We will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. So what is... There, there's a bit of a question here. Do, do pastors today primarily function 
like the apostles uh, back then and to what degree. And certain modern new apostolic movements, they think absolutely yes and stuff. And we're a little bit more subtle about it. We say maybe, you know, maybe in some senses, but in some senses, probably not because we're not the 12. Nobody is. Uh, and But I, I still think in, in the most basic sense, your, your top leadership in church structure, regardless of how you might structure it, ought to be uh, your primary devotion is to prayer and the ministry of the word. If you're called to teach and preach, that's probably what you should primarily be doing. Sure. Right. I, I, and I think that bowls out in the way that Paul will later uh, in his pastoral epistles define elder leadership, which would get categorized under presbytery because we don't like the term elders in congregational led worship. Uh, but anyways, um, where, where he says basically their uh, ministry is prayer, minister to the, to the word. Uh, if if and when you can, you visit people uh, in the hospital and the sick and the, the unhealthy and those in prison, stuff like that, uh, which is where we've developed it all. But this is a very early, succinct form of spelling out the same thing. It's not a very detailed way. Paul has had time to think about it by the time he's writing. He's, he's directly addressing it. Luke is at best indirectly addressing it. And I'm just pointing out that there's an indirect idea that, that your, your main leadership up top cannot be dragged down to do things that uh, they're not directly called to do by and large. You know, you know, 40 hours a week, ministry is not really a 40 hour week job, you know, just break it down. 35 hours of your time should be in prayer and, and ministry. I don't know what the number is. I'm throwing out a random example, you know, in five hours a week or, or a day or you know, whatever devoted to uh, things that are not prayer and ministry. Because if you're not functioning as, as these baseline disciplines, your walk with the Lord is going to suffer. Your leadership is going to suffer and you're going to end up guiding the rest of the community outside of God's will. So it, the, the leadership sticking to what leadership does is very important. And what leadership does is focus on the word and prayer. The bulk of, of uh, my time each day is, is somehow devoted to this before I even come into the office. Because once I get into the office, it's usually stuff that doesn't revolve around the word and prayer. Uh, so I, I, I make that my priority by doing it at home in my private time and then coming in to official office hours. Okay. Anything else anybody gleans from that or wants to point out or any questions on those first four verses? That's really cool. It's cool? What? Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> well, I do think that verse seven is like, it's setting it up as here's the formula of, of what the church has to be. And verse seven is the, the proof. Verse seven. Okay, so we'll, we'll get to that yeah. in, ju in just a second, but that's why it's the conclusion to this portion. Oh, I couldn't uh, uh, We hadn't read it. Uh, yeah. So okay. It's all on the same screens. So. <laughs> um. So their advice. We're going to put seven men over this. All right. Seven is typically their number of a form of completion. Whatever the numberings are for the widows who need food, they think seven is enough to complete it. It's not a saying there has to be seven people doing every task or whatever, a committee of seven, but they're going to choose seven. And the qualifications are full of the spirit and wisdom. Now, as we go through, and I'll read verse five and six and, and seven, as we go through, look at the list of the names and tell me what you can glean about these seven people based on their names. So verse five, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Timon, I don't know how you pronounce that. Parmenas and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and large numbers of priests became obedient to the faith. So what's the, the thing that they end up choosing seven men who are all what group? that the apostles didn't make part of the category? Um, the, the end to the middle of the alphabet? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's not a single B in there. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing.
the, these names, Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolas are all what group? They're Greek names. They're Greek names. Yeah. So these are all members of the, most likely members not of the Hebraic group, but the Hellenized group. Now, the apostles didn't say choose seven Hellenized men. They just said choose seven men. And the entire community, even apparently the Hebraic group, signed off on seven Hebra uh, Hellenized men to, to do this work. Was there animosity between these two groups? To a degree, yes. Uh, it, it, it was often that way because there, there's just, everybody thinks that they know the right way to go about doing one yeah. thing or another. When... The, these people who, who have this shared history, I mean, this is not unlike what we go on today uh, with, with, you know, discussing from a federal level and a state level, what is everybody's rights down to an individual level. We're all Jews. We all have a shared history. We all share certain things in common. We're all God's people. They, they know that. They believe that. But the, the question comes down to how do we express that? And different people want to do that different ways. So do churches down to today. We all want something different. The first time the note in the bulletin went out, which I guess was just last week, uh, about looking for a drummer, immediately people started uh, coming to me and saying, do you have to have drums? We don't want the drums. If you do the drums, can you do those songs first so that I can, I, I can just come in after the drums? It's like everybody really? thinks... It, that it, and and I was I was so shocked by it because I again it it, it had been out for like two hours as far as everybody getting a bulletin is concerned. Also, we and, used to have drums all the time. Yeah. Well, but we had two separate about services for years, and it was before what? we joined. We thought about drums for how long? Like twenty five. Even when we incorporated them, it was very gentle. Literally. Like yeah, it's not it like it was. But, yeah. Russian, so but I, I, I'm I'm using it as an example. In the one service, yes, yeah. they were never in the other service. <laughs> and then <laughs> when we joined, that was a huge discussion: was what music we were going to have, and they said they were going to mix the two, but but they didn't. I was I was so shocked and caught off guard by it, yeah. especially probably the first time that I was less than courteous in my response to it. But I was trying to be by like the time the third person came up to me, I was like trying to catch, was I as courteous as I thought I was the first time? Yeah, probably not. Uh, let me try and be a little more courteous here and, and try and point people to the fact that worship not being about us, mm -hmm. what does it matter? If, if you don't want to be part of it, hey, if you want to make worship all about you, go do that and I'll meet you at the throne of God and we'll all answer for our choices, right? And for me, it just comes down to this. But as a community, we are, are trying to actually be united, remain united, and solve these problems where everybody thinks that they know what they want. Uh, and that, unfortunately, in our culture that they didn't live with, in our radically individualized cultures, everybody thinks they have a right to get what they want. They think the church exists. They don't consciously think this, but I mean, you break down their path of thinking. They think the church consciously exists to give them what they say they want or need. Now, maybe they have legitimate needs, like food. That's a legitimate need. Getting your way in how music works is not a need. And, and you probably don't have any say uh, in it. Uh, and, but if, if, if it's really about God, in the end, the mediums you use, the instrumentations you use, this tempo and keys that you use are less relevant than the fact that you're all together worshiping God. So you have to keep your hierarchy of values together. Their hierarchy of values of saying we're all Jews and we have this common ancestry is keeping them united. But we have this problem as we're trying to express our different cultures here. We think that in the daily distribution of food, our uh, widows are getting left by the side, side of the road. They're being treated as second-class citizens next to the Hebraic Jews. Whatever that specifically means or look like, Luke doesn't record for us. He doesn't want us to get bogged down in those details. Just that there was internal conflict in the church. The response from the leadership is to say, okay, good point. We're going to solve this by you deciding uh, who you're going to pick. They pick all seven men from the he uh, Hellenized side of things. Men who were full of the Spirit. Men who are above reproach, as Paul would say in the pastoral letters when picking this. Men who 
both sides of the aisle thought had a good enough reputation to take on this task. And as we get through this with Stephen, Stephen is the standout character even amongst these seven men who will go on to be called, you know, the deacons. The first deacons. So, do you know, did Greek widows have any different rights than the Hellenistic or the, the Hebraic widows or anything? Empire-wide, probably, depending on rights of travel stuff. You know, not everybody had rights of travel under the Roman uh, laws. Uh, non Full Roman citizens like Paul, who is a Hellenized Jew, by the way, um, would have full rights of travel because he is both a Hellenized Jew and a Roman citizen. So if some of the widows were Roman citizens, imperially they would have had more rights. Within the church community, there should not have been anything that distinguished them as having more rights because the kingdom of God is supposed to be flipping this around. Just because the, the non-godly imperial powers have structured it so that you can lord it over everybody else doesn't mean that God's community is supposed to function that way. There is hierarchy to this. Uh, you have to have hierarchy to have order. But the hierarchy is not, uh, of the Twelve are not using their powers to say, ah, hush up. They're not even using their powers to say, okay, we'll solve the problem for you. Good leadership designates power out, and they don't seem to have been expressing it in any way, shape, and form that would put anybody above anybody else. Perhaps that was the perception of what was happening to the Hellenized Jew uh, widows. So they're they're solving it by putting the leadership over this task as being Hellenized men. Uh, that seems, I mean, if you're going to get upset because your Jews are getting left out, you put Hellenized men uh, above this. They're, maybe they're not paying attention. Maybe the numbers are wrong or something, and maybe it's all, all in your mind and just a matter of perception, not reality. But the, the solution on a practical level was get, give the men you think can be responsible for it, and the men they all agree to is uh, seven Hellenized Jews, which doesn't seem to be based on any extra rights that they had or something, just here a practical solution to the problem. And because of that, as Rachel has already pointed out, the word of God spread. Paul, I think Luke's phrase like this for the word of God spreading, um, up till now, it's basically been a little bit of conflict, Ananias and Sapphira, the Jewish leaders in, in the first two conflicts here. The word of God is spreading because they're coming up against conflict and, and resolving that conflict and keeping the peace. When we turn to chapter 7 and 8, we get Peter's speech, and then by the end of the 8, the persecution breaks out. The word of God is actually going to spread because the conflict is continuing and not necessarily being resolved. And then God's going to resolve the conflict because the persecution is being spearheaded by Paul or Saul of Tarsus. He's going to convert Saul, and then Saul is going to spread it. And You, you, you get what you get in every story. What, what is the essence of every story? Conflict and the resolution of conflict. So you're getting these mini stories here so that conflict, resolution, conflict, God keeps doing his work. Conflict, resolution, conflict, or uh, what we looked at last week wasn't so much resolution of conflict of saying the, the conflict's not fully done yet, but this scene is. Yeah, we're going to go on disobeying you, uh, but you're going to whip us and be done with it and see if things die out on their own. They won't. I mean, uh, one way that, that you could read this now that I think about it is is... In light of Gamaliel's words last week, hey, uh, sex that, that pop up that aren't from God tend to die off really quickly, right? That was his argument. So leave them alone and see if they die off. And then Luke immediately tells us a story about this internal conflict. Is this internal conflict going to be the thing that stops this movement from actually succeeding? No, they handle the internal conflict fairly well. Uh, they, they resolve it. They look for the qualifications of men full of the spirit and wisdom. They do not look for the qualifications of pick seven Hellenized men full of the Spirit. But the community does. And it solves the problem. Things get to go on, and so the Word of God spreads. There was no hindrance to the Word of God by individuals getting in the way of the community and saying, I want my will done. Which, if we're not careful, is always the temptation. I don't like that. I'm not willing to be part of this community if you don't do this. And we, you know, 
I, I've been a part of churches who, who th- this is one thing I hate about setting up the online giving is that I, I, I have to see coming in who gives what to be able to communicate with the, with the trustees, with Charles and stuff. I hate knowing who gives what uh, because when people come to me and, and nobody's done it in this church, but uh, I've had people come to me yes. in, in churches before when I didn't know who was giving and they say, hey, don't you know how much I'm giving? I expect you to do what I want. And it's like, first off, no, I don't know how much you're giving. I have plausible deniability on that. I don't want to know. Uh, if you tell me, I'm going to delete it from my brain and, as well as this entire conversation because I don't want to know. Uh, because I don't want the people who are giving the most financially to assume that in God's kingdom that the people get their way based on funding. It, 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 it doesn't work that way. But, I, but I've had people, you know... I, I've been doing this for 21 years. Uh, well, well, I've been a Christian for 21 years. I haven't been in ministry. I've been in ministry for, for what, 17 years? Uh, and, and it was incredible. It's like, I, I was just the intern. And I had people in my, my first internship in Muskogee, Oklahoma, uh, expecting me to go to my boss, the youth pastor, and turn the youth ministry into what they wanted because of the amount of money that they gave. And I said, no, I'm not going and doing that. Uh, that's not going to happen. First off, I'm only going to be here for the, for the, for the summer, anyways. What pool do you think I have? Just because right. I know, just because I've known the youth minister longer than you, uh, because he was my youth minister before he came here. You know, even if I thought I could, that would be the wrong move to make. Secondly, uh, his responsibility is is supposed to be to the ministry and, and prayer, right? He shouldn't be hung up on on what the rest of us want. This is a good reason to have committees. You know, you hear the voice of the people. You can say, what do the people want? But what you know, what you really have to do, unfortunately, we don't always do this before we form a committee, is you, you have to lay out, okay, what is actually God's will? And you have to draw the line around what is God's will and what is not. So that you know, inside of this, you can do whatever you want. You can shape the community just about however you want as long as you're inside God's will. And so you see different expressions of churches. This question between Hebraic and Hellenized Jews is in some ways in the story, it's foreshadowing the conflict that's going to come up in Acts 15. Paul's going around developing Hellenized churches. The Hellenized churches do not express keeping the law the same way the Hebraic Jews do in the Holy Land under the Pharisees' historical teachings. James is leader of the church by this time. And even he does not say, okay, we need to make the Hellenized Jews, hell, short for Hellenized Jews, look like the Hebraic Jews uh, in Acts 15. Here, they, they say the Hellenized Jews get to be the Hellenized Jews in our community, in the Holy Land. The Hebraic Jews get to be the Hellenized Jews. But when you start adding the Gentiles in, And now the Gentiles are going to look a lot closer to the Hellenized Jews and start outnumbering the Hebraic Jews. And you get Acts 15 coming along. I should write 15 up there. Uh, Then they have to deal with this uh, in in what you see is, you know, an an Episcopal council movement where the leaders in Jerusalem, the 12, James, Paul, they all meet together and say, what decisions do we need to make for all the churches? And they basically came up with four things. And we'll get to that. And they're basically four don'ts. Don't do this. Don't do that. This or that. And then do whatever you want. You have the freedom for it. But in order to, to correctly express your freedom, you actually have to know what is God's will. And so they, as, as long as God's word is being expressed, as long as the gospel of King Jesus and his glorified status at the right hand of God is being expressed, churches can build their communities however they want. They can worship God in whatever way they want. I always try and get people to think of Deconstructing arguments is, is a great tool if you can reconstruct arguments afterwards. Now, some people just deconstruct, deconstruct, and never reconstruct. When people come to me and they say, I don't like this or I don't like that as far as worship, um, I, I, and the, the battle goes on, well, is it, is it hymns or is it contemporary or is it this or is it that? Uh, it, it's, it's a silly argument if you deconstruct it a little bit because what is making all music? and all noise at the most fundamental level. If not, if I could just break it down to the most fundamental level, God doesn't care which way you vibrate the air molecules. That's not what pleases God. God doesn't care if you make sound hitting a drum or hitting a piano string. 
It's the vibrations that create the sound. And then you control the vibrations to make the tonics, the notes, the melodies and stuff. God doesn't give a crap about which path you use to do it. It doesn't say singing these songs uh, pleases God and singing these songs doesn't anywhere in the Bible. It says without faith, it's impossible to please God. The only way that God actually accepts any form of worship or any form of service, which is more what we're talking about here in this, is to say you actually have to do it by faith. Faithfulness to God, finding ways to express itself. And if you don't get your way, you don't break faith with the community. You find ways to actually go on participating in the work of God and what he's doing, even if different subgroups are going to express it different ways. Be they different Sunday school classes, going through different books of the Bible or different lessons or whatever, different churches with different, different preachers within churches preaching different ways, different musicians picking different songs and leading in different ways. It's all valid so long as it's done by faith. It's all invalid so long as there is no faith. So they resolved the problem. The numbers of the disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and large numbers of priests became obedient to the faith which is important in light of the second conflict that we looked at last week. These are connected ideas. So Gamaliel's idea of saying, maybe they'll just burn themselves out and you don't have to do anything, comes up as the very next argument. Are they going to have such conflict that they burn themselves out? No, they resolve the conflict and quite the opposite. They continue growing so rapidly and so uh, powerfully that even the people that they were in conflict with outside the community is coming into the community. The ability to resolve conflict uh, actually is a very powerful presentation of the, the power of the gospel. It teaches people, oh, there are different options out there. I can be part of different groups. And the most attractive ones look like the ones who are not conflict-free, but healthy conflict. You can't even be conflict-free in your own household. I mean, I can. I'm the only person there. <laughs> but, but I'm not conflict free with my neighbors all the time, right? So, and and churches do not need to be or aim for conflict free. Mm -hmm. But a uh, healthy resolution of conflict is is the name of the game, right? Here we get a a, a great expression of healthy resolution to conflict by actually letting the community make its own decisions, which is a healthy expression of leadership by the 12. They don't do what some churches would do and say, don't worry, we'll pick your, your solution for you. Letting people express their own freedoms and saying, how would you go about doing this? If we empowered you with the right to choose, what would you choose? An agreement is struck between the entire community, the 12, and now this, this middleman uh, group of seven, and it keeps the community going. I think... One thing we need to think about here is that at the initial outset of, of the, the choosing of these first seven deacons, and I see nothing that changes in any New Testament expression of what deacons are, deacons don't have any governing power. The word just means servants. They are there to perform specific tasks that need to be done so that the what we might today label as the pastoral stat uh, does not need to get bogged down in them. Which is interesting because there, there are churches that are, they, they function as congregational led, but they're basically presbyteries because their pastors and elder, uh, elders are defined as deacons. Pastoral staff, deacon, who's functioning as elders, but called deacons because they don't, church, you, you'll follow that, that path uh, on there. We broke off from churches when we did because we didn't want their governing structure. And we argue these semantics around there so we can't be labeled as having elders or something, right? But you do. Uh, and and it, it's just silly on a, on a lot of levels. But here, and I, and I think the New Testament is clear as, as best I can read it, as saying deacons just don't have any governing authority. We call those people elders. They, that language grows out of the Jewish synagogues who were elder-led. Uh, and what all that means. We're, we're wrapping up new language with presbyters uh, in this, in the New Testament and stuff, but it, it's basically semantics. Uh, it's, it's the functioning here. Okay. Now, 
we don't have time to go through 8 through 15, and this probably won't be part of the, the lesson when Carla comes back, but uh, I just want to read 8 through 15 and uh, just get the sense of who Stephen is before we start diving into his words to the Sanhedrin. 8 through 15 says, Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power. Luke takes time in a very short amount of sentences to repeat the same thing about Stephen. He is a man full of grace, uh, God's grace and power, full of his spirit, right? Uh, he's, he's excellent. You cannot speak better words about Stephen. He performed great wonders and signs among the people. Interesting. Now the, these, these seven deacons, Philip will also come up later on uh, after Stephen's dead, but uh, these deacons are actually doing what the apostolic mission on the temple that we looked at was doing. Interesting. Okay. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, which was probably a specific group of Jews in the promised land that were former slaves. Jews of Cyrene, Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. So from being outside the, the Holy Land and all from around these Mediterranean coastal areas of Asia Minor, the uh, island of Cyprus and stuff, they're Hellenized Jews. So it seems that Stephen is ministering amongst his own people, amongst his own kind. But they could not stand up to the wisdom and spirit, uh, the, the spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. So we're back to the Jewish authorities. So now conflict is arising from outside the Jewish authorities, but because they don't have enough governing political power to do anything about it, and they can't win arguments on their own, they're going to resort to political power to come and, and help them. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin, who we met last week. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. So they're absolute liars. They're twisting justice. Uh, they're, they're doing exactly what Jesus' trial was done. False witnesses are being brought all of the public words are, are irrelevant, and they just hire people, corrupt men to twist justice. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw his face was like the face of an angel, which is probably not to say he was shining out all brilliantly in light, but to say, look, everybody looked at Stephen, and everybody knew that man is innocent, and everybody else is wrong. And it was so obvious to everybody in the courtroom that day, right? Uh, and, and so that sets up the coming conflict for next week. Uh, any, anything quickly on that before? I have a question back on uh, seven, though. When they refer to priests now, are they still talking about like the Sadducees, or is, this, or is that a different group of people? Now, see, I, I, I don't entirely know for sure. I don't think we have enough records. It, it, the, the priest would, of course be the Levites, but uh, the tribe of Levi, specifically the descendants of Aaron, those were allowed to be the priest. Um, I suspect that it would make up both Sadducees and some Pharisees, because to be a priest is a category that pre-existed both labels of Sadducees and Pharisees. Some Pharisees were could be priests if their bloodline could be traced. Some Sadducees were too. I don't think they had the ability to stop it. The, the Sadducees, of course, have the governing control of the temple uh, from the Hasmonean dynasty. There was probably a greater emphasis of priests from the Sadducees, but you could still be a Pharisee. Just because you were one or the other, and this is probably why he used the term priest here instead of Pharisees or Sadducees, that it is possible, and I would say even likely, that just because it's not the 70 elders of the Sanhedrin, Sadducees and Pharisees from both groups were still coming to be believers in Christ uh, from that. That vague language at least leaves that possibility open. But men who could influence and would have contact with the Sanhedrin, but not necessarily be on the Sanhedrin. Anything else? All right. Thank you, guys.